so we have uh, discussed in the last class regarding the cardiac arrest algorithm so uh, what i thought today we will discuss is the reversible causes of cardiac arrest which is very important thing that you need to remember what are the reversible causes of cardiac arrest and in a cardiac arrest scenario it is very difficult for us to find out what is the exact cause that why this patient had a cardiac arrest so you might not know the patient is just collapsed in front of you you have to think all these causes but you should have an idea that why the patient is having any of these things what could be the reason how will you suspect okay this could be the probable reason this could be the probable reason of cardiac arrest you should have some suspicion in your mind otherwise with this thing you can't do may, many investigations because to know hypovolemia you need to check a blood pressure but in a cardiac arrest how to check the blood pressure there is no blood pressure that you will be able to measure in that situation hypoxia how will you know that the patient is having hypoxia because the, you are doing back mask ventilation and doing giving cpr so during that time it will be very difficult for you to find out the exact causes of cardiac arrest so we should have some clues okay this is there is a history like this so with this background history probably this could be the reason for cardiac arrest we can only have a guess but there are certain things that you are pretty sure okay this is the cause of cardiac arrest suppose a patient had an uh, drowning and he has been evacuated because we clearly know that because the respiratory system is in trouble so primary cause will be hypoxia will be the primary cause there why this patient had a cardiac arrest but certain situation it is very difficult for us to say okay this is the cause for cardiac arrest so we have to see how will you find out first one will go ahead with the hypovolemia so hypovolemia we can take it as the one of the cause for your cardiac arrest so when will you suspect that okay the probable cause of cardiac arrest can be hypovolemia when will you suspect that so when will you suspect any one of you okay blood loss that is a very good thing suppose the patient had a blood loss history blood loss so it can be a hemorrhagic shock the patient had an hemorrhagic shock the patient had a profound hematemesis and the patient had a profound hematemesis like they are telling that almost 1 to 2 liters of blood the patient have lost and the patient has been brought in so blood loss one of the most important reason the second one it can be dehydration yes but severe dehydration relating to hypotension then causing a cardiac arrest can happen but dehydration will keep it down blood loss is the most important reason it can be a traumatic blood loss following a trauma the patient had a trauma to the chest the blood can get collected into the chest wall or into the abdomen or into the pelvis or there can be an external hemorrhage so most important thing that you can consider hypovolemic shock is that the patient had any of this history in the background so you need to consider that okay this can be a reason of cardiac arrest so hypovolemia that is when we have to suspect see whenever we are discussing a cardiac arrest scenario we are just having six people right one two three four five and six so ideally we are concentrating on resuscitating the patient but we doesn't we are not moving out from the patient so ideally another person should go and ask with the family if it is available what happened exactly so rather than taking a sample history later down ideally when we say that after that everything is over you go and take a sample history but this resuscitation should not stop this should continue and another person can go to the family and they can take a brief history what exactly happened if you are getting that if somebody has been resuscitated brought in from a trauma this thing so primary cause will be an hemorrhagic shock so blood loss will be your number one differential diagnosis that you need to consider so that is how you need to suspect hypovolemia suppose otherwise what you can see that you had a patient referred from another hospital imagine the patient has been brought in in another in an ambulance from another hospital so the patient is already on multiple vasopressors already on noradrenaline all other drugs the patient is already on and the patient has been brought in and you are receiving the patient and soon after arrival to the er he arrested so that is can be one of the reason can be again it can be due to shock it might not be due to hypovolemia it may be due to septic shock so you can you have to imagine that hypovolemia primarily the cause is blood loss but there are other type of shocks also which can lead on to cardiac arrest like septic shock septic shock there will be associated metabolic acidosis also and the patient can go into cardiac arrest so 
always it will not be a single thing it can be multifactorial also that also you need to consider suppose you get a history that this patient like what i gave you the history the patient has been brought in an ambulance suppose there is already underlying renal failure so there is chance of hyperkalemia acidosis chance is there because acid base balance is impaired so there can be chance of acidosis next it can be already the patient can have hypotension so there can be multiple reasons why a patient can have a cardiac arrest so you need to consider all those things so what you have to ideally do is that you have to immediately suspect your reversible cause of cardiac arrest and which one will be the most probable cause for cardiac arrest in this patient it can be one reason or it can be multiple reason so the first one what we discuss is hypovolemia so the next one what is the next x what we can discuss is hypoxia hypoxia so hypoxia so when will you suspect hypoxia so how will you suspect and how will you confirm that okay this is a hypoxic cardiac arrest so when will you suspect hypoxia as i said a drowning victim that is the primary reason is hypoxic cardiac arrest so the next reason it can be what again the patient you can remember that the patient is already on an oxygen because the patient is in the uh, for example the patient is in the er he has been received he has been getting treated for ards acute respiratory distress syndrome and there already there is a hypoxia that is being set in and the patient is not improving and deteriorating so hypoxia develops and the patient can go into cardiac arrest so hypoxia when we can suspect like this we can we'll be able to get this history the next thing is that the patient is already because we had a few patients like this the patient was already on oxygen therapy at home because for some reason maybe a chronic copd or bronchial asthma or ild some reason the patient is already on an oxygen therapy so what they happened the patient had some breathlessness to bring into the hospital they will just switch off the oxygen and they will just bring in their own vehicle so what will happen already the patient was on oxygen and suddenly they have disconnected and the patient can go into cardiac arrest so that can be hypoxia so hypoxia while taking an abg at this point of time during cardiac arrest it's very very difficult to get an abg itself because we are doing compression we have to palpate the blood vessel and to get an abg is difficult but to get during cardiac arrest whatever po2 value that you are able to get it will be always low it will not be very high unless and until the patient is already on ventilator and he has been given very good fio2 the fio2 the po2 will be very low so we cannot say that sometimes you will get a vbg only suppose with seeing that we will not be able to say that it is a hypoxic cardiac arrest or not then what could be the other reason for hypoxic cardiac arrest sudden aspiration sudden aspiration and choking the patient because a small child the child was playing around and like one and a half year to two years and suddenly the child has become unresponsive what could be the reason the most important reason can be a choking the child could have taken a foreign body and it would have taken to the mouth and the child would have choked so that could be the hypoxia could be the reason for cardiac arrest there so you have to have an open mind you have to have an open mind that this is the cause you cannot say we have to have all the causes you need to get in but you need to have another person who need to go to the patient's family and need to get the history and other reason is an old age person okay who is an old age person the common history that we will get is that he is already having some parkinsonism some or something he was having some food or water and suddenly after that he collapsed so the most common is aspiration choking and hypoxia so their hypoxia can be so these histories you need to link in then only you will get okay this is the probable cause for cardiac arrest another example that i can give you is that the patient is already bedridden okay the patient is already bedridden for last two weeks now the patient has said that last since yesterday the patient had some breathlessness and today the patient was suddenly become unresponsive so what will you suspect at that time what will you suspect at that time bedridden patient breathlessness pulmonary embolism so pulmonary embolism so again thrombosis is again down the line there is one pulmonary embolism so pulmonary embolism again cause of cardiac arrest is hypoxia so hypoxia and hypotension if it is a massive pulmonary embolism it cause hypotension also so that is the clue that you will get in your mind so this part is very important you are looking for reversible cause of cardiac arrest how will you look for the reversible causes you have to take a basic history what happened what is the drugs that patient is on because during the code the team cannot go another person should go to the family and should quickly see what all the drugs the patient was on all those things you should need to take in so that is what is hypoxia is all about then the next thing what we'll is the next is the h plus ions h plus ions so h plus ions see you can have two types of acidosis you can have metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis right 
metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis. So these both these acidosis can cause into cardiac arrest. So when will you suspect a metabolic acidosis? Already I have told because already this patient imagine that this patient is a known case of CKD, non chronic kidney disease. He is on maintenance hemodialysis. Imagine that he is on a maintenance hemodialysis. He skipped a dialysis of last due dialysis he skipped. Now he has been suddenly become unresponsive and brought into you. So here we can confirm acid H plus ions by taking an VBG or ABG. VBG or ABG should be sufficient enough and we can confirm there whether there is an acidosis is there or not. If the pH is less than 7.35 it is definitely acidosis. So this is the clue that you will get. Okay, acidosis is causing this cardiac arrest. So usually acidosis causing a cardiac arrest, the pH will be less than 7.1. Usually, when you 7.2 and all will not usually cause cardiac arrest. Less than 7.1 usually will cause cardiac arrest. And if the pH is very low, something like less than 7 and 6.9, and in a cardiac arrest scenario, you can give a drug called as soda bicarbonate. So that is the drug that you need to give when we have uh, cardiac arrest. We will discuss each drugs in details. During that time, I will teach you regarding soda bicarbonate. So just imagine that for cardiac arrest, when you are suspecting a cardiac arrest and the patient is having a metabolic acidosis and the pH is less than 7.1 or 6.9 is some recommendation. If there isn't cardiac arrest and you are seeing an acidosis, you can give soda bicarbonate approximately just remember 50 milliequivalents and how to calculate and all those things I will tell 50 milliequivalents you can just give as a stat blows. So that is only when it is a severe acidosis and the patient is in cardiac arrest. Not for all acidosis I am not saying this patient is in cardiac arrest and there is an associated acidosis. So this is what when will you suspect CKD patients or other, otherwise there is a prolonged hypotension okay and lactase has gone up. So lactic acidosis causing an uh, uh, metabolic acidosis. The other one is renal failure causing a metabolic acidosis. Like this, all these things you need to suspect when only you will have to take a history. Then only you will come to know. Otherwise, it is very difficult. So, metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis. Already the patient is on a known COPD. Known COPD on BiPAP. Suddenly there is an acute onset of breathlessness and the patient had worsened. So, the reason for respiratory acidosis, the patient can have either hypoxia also along with it and with PCO2 buildup. So it can be a type 2 respiratory failure leading on to cardiac arrest. So always keep in mind that acidosis both you can have metabolic and respiratory but metabolic is more potential to cause cardiac arrest. Again metabolic acidosis causing cardiac arrest when the patient is already having a coronary artery disease underlying CAD they are more prone to develop arrhythmias. So for a normal person, if pH is going low, below 7 and all, they will only have this arrhythmias like VF and VT. But in a cardiac, already there is a coronary artery disease. As the pH goes down, the chance of having arrhythmia also increases. So they are more prone to develop arrhythmia much before than a normal patient. For a normal person, maybe they will tolerate like 6.97 to develop an arrhythmia. But in a cardiac history, already there is a coronary artery disease because already their myocardium is weak. And already there can be some scarring already has happened. So they will be more prone to develop an arrhythmia when the pH comes down. So 7.1 itself they will start having this arrhythmia. So those group of patients you might need to give early bicarbonate. So this is what you need to keep in mind. So they, uh, how acidosis takes? Acidosis will come and as a result there will be an arrhythmia like VT, VF broad complex tachycardia, whatever you have discussed, it will happen. So unless and until you are correcting that this thing, the arrhythmia will not subside. So we have seen a VFVT, we are shocking, we are giving a mirror on, but you have to correct the acidosis also. Then only the rhythm will be back to normal. So that is H plus ion. So we have covered which all things? We have covered hypolemia, hypoxia and H plus ions. Next thing what we have to do is the hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. Hyper and hypokalemia hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. So both of this, both hyper and hypokalemia can cause cardiac arrest. So again, when will you suspect a hyperkalemia? The most common things that the patient is a known chronic kidney disease. So the patient is already on a chronic kidney disease or this patient is having an acute kidney injury. Maybe due to sepsis or some drug toxicity, there is an associated acute kidney injury. You have already have to suspect hyperkalemia or this patient is already taking some potassium spiring diuretics like example spironolactone, potassium spiring diuretics like which group of patient they will take potassium spiring diuretics, which group of patients you will commonly see. 
using these drugs, potassium sparing diuretics. You will see chronic liver disease patient using this and also CAD patients with heart failure. So these two groups of patients, this drug will be there. So that could be the reason for the hyperkalemia and hyperkalemia can cause into cardiac arrest. Hyperkalemia, it will lead on to what? It will lead on to arrhythmia and into cardiac arrest. So that is how the pattern it can, the patient can have a white complex tachycardia. So hyperkalemia, so this group of patient you need to suspect and you need to check the drug history, what the patient is taking on drug or any toxins any toxins the patient has consumed which can cause hyperkalemia so commonly what you have to remember see chronic kidney disease acute kidney injury patients and the patient is already on potassium sparing diuretics they are prone to develop this hyperkalemia and hypokalemia who will be prone to develop again the patient who is on diuretics again the patient is on lasix that is fruzimide so if there are fruzimide out there they are not taken enough uh, electrolytes they have dehydration multiple episode of vomiting diarrhea but hypokalemia causing a cardiac arrest means the calcium level the potassium level has to be very very low like less than two and all only it will cause hypokalemic cardiac arrest so what you have to do when you have seen a hyperkalemic cardiac arrest we have to follow the algorithm and you have to give calcium gluconate calcium gluconate and what is the other drug that you need to give is soda bicarbonate. Soda bicarbonate we routinely won't use for management of hyperkalemia. But hyperkalemia with cardiac arrest we can use soda bicarbonate. And the drug of choice other one is calcium gluconate. So these are the additional drugs that you need to add. So when you are having a hypokalemic cardiac arrest what you have to give? You have to give KCL. But routine KCL we will give it as a slow infusion. But here it is in cardiac arrest we have to give in 10 to 15 minutes as a bolus. We have to give a little bit faster. So that is the difference. Uh, infusion protocol I will teach you later but just remember you have to keep these things in your mind okay so that is regarding your hyperkalemia and hypokalemia so the next one is hypothermia so the next head is hypothermia see in our climatic condition to have a hypothermic cardiac arrest is very 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 less so hypothermia but when you go to European countries US and all because hypothermic cardiac arrest is very common. So hypothermic cardiac arrest is very common. But what you have to remember is that one group of patients, they are very prone to develop. We had a patient a couple of days back in, the, in our ICU who had an hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is very prone to cause hy hypothermia. So hypothermia can be seen in our group of patients. Routinely, we don't see because our climatic conditions are not like that. Our climatic condition to have a 34, 32 degree temperature and to go into that situation is very, very, very less here. So hypothermic cardiac arrest, we don't see here. And what is the ECG finding that you need to remember is something called as Osborne waves. So we'll, uh, I will teach you that in the next ECG class. Osborne waves is seen in what hypothermia in when you have a patient with hypothermia and you are seeing something called as Osborne wave we can call it as hypothermia is the reason for this Osborne waves and hypothermic cardiac arrest in our scenario what you have to remember is that if the patient core temperature you have mentioned that the core temperature is very very low it is the body temperature is 94 degree Fahrenheit 96 degree Fahrenheit very very low at that time you have to suspect hypothyroidism so hypothyroidism so that is very rare to cause cardiac arrest because we have in uh, seen an hypothyroidism causing hypothermia and causing cardiac arrest but that is only one scenario that we can think of but otherwise they have to come from northeast where there is snowfall and the patient has been out in the snow for a long time because after consuming alcohol he might have collapsed there and uh, after a very long time because of the climate snow and all the body went into hypothermia and later on he went into a cardiac arrest so what is the problem with hypothermia is that when you have a patient with hypothermia Till the body temperature is normal, you cannot declare him dead. <clears throat> because for our normal physiology to happen, our normal, till that time, the normal body temperature, you need to continue resuscitation. So you have to rewarm the patient. So when you have a hypothermic cardiac arrest, you have to rewarm the patient with a bear hugger or something. Then you improve the core body temperature. Then only if still you are not able to get the uh, rhythm properly, there is no ROC, then only you can declare. So you cannot declare a cold patient. So the patient has to be warm. So till that time, you need to resuscitate a patient with hypothermia. That is the only difference. But in our climatic condition, it is very, very, very rare. So that is the H that we have covered. So we have discussed regarding the hypovolemia, hypoxia, hypothermia, H plus ions, and hypo and hyperkalemia. So this is how you need to suspect this could be the cause for your cardiac arrest the next causes will go to the t so what is the first t that you can remember already we have covered is thrombosis which thrombosis we have covered thrombosis we have covered 
pulmonary thrombosis because bedridden patient sudden hypoxia breathlessness you have to suspect pulmonary thromboembolism then it is the coronary thrombosis so coronary thrombosis is what how will you get the history you ask the bystander they will come the patient had a chest pain and he collapsed the patient was feeling some discomfort in the chest and he collapsed so after your return of spontaneous circulation you take a to lead ecg and see what is the std changes anything is there or not if there is associated std changes we can confirm that the patient had probably had a coronary artery disease and coronary thrombosis that would be the reason for cardiac arrest suppose you are getting a patient in vtvf he, there is no other comorbidities there is no other comorbidities and suddenly he had a chest pain and he collapsed and when you assess the patient he is having a vt or vf so again the vt and vf can be due to coronary artery disease so that is the time when we suspect coronary thrombosis and if the patient is having coronary thrombosis after resuscitation immediately they should be shifted for what primary coronary intervention they should be immediately shifted for cath lab for open up the blood vessel so that is the 2t what is the next t tamponade so tamponade what is tamponade basically it is cardiac tamponade cardiac tamponade so what is basically happening in cardiac tamponade so i'll show you the picture suppose this is your uh, heart and there is the pericardium right so this is the pericardium so normally there is some amount of fluid between your two pericardium normally it will be very minimal so suddenly suppose there is a rend in this ventricle okay there is an opening in this ventricle due to trauma and suddenly the pericardial effusion has increased so here this area is totally filled up with blood because of this because of an opening or it can be due to a tuberculosis or it can be due to a malignancy so these are the common reasons why you can have an pericardial effusion so pericardial effusion is just a collection of fluid but once it causes a hypotension in a such a way that this tamponade whatever be the collection it will go and obstruct the cardiac output and it will result in decrease in venous return so what will happen there will be hypotension so that is called as cardiac tamponade so pericardial effusion if it is increasing in size which is causing obstruction to the cardiac output and to the venous return we can call it as cardiac tamponade so cardiac tamponade when you will suspect suppose your patient is having a probable a pericardial effusion previously there was a history so the patient was getting treated for uh, pericardial effusion now suddenly he had collapsed so you have to always suspect that whether it is a cardiac tamponade that is causing this or the patient has come with a chest trauma trauma to the chest and resulting in probably there can be a cardiac tamponade so how can you confirm you have to do an bedside focused assessment sonography in trauma that is what is called as fast focused assessment sonography in trauma so what you have to do if it is a trauma patient we'll call it as fast for other group of patients just keep the echo probe and see whether there is any pericardial effusion that is resulting in a tamponade if there is a large pericardial effusion we need to drain this pericardial effusion and that procedure is called as pericardiosynthesis so you have to do a bedside pericardiosynthesis then only the patient will improve so remember that cardiac tamponade when will you suspect cardiac tamponade you have to have a patient with pericardial effusion that will be the history and now the patient have become suddenly collapsed or the patient has come in hypotension see all cardiac tamponade need not come in uh, cardiac arrest they can go into hypotension and if you are not identifying there then only they will go for cardiac arrest so before that you will have what are the signs that you need to understand that is called as bex triad bex triad so what are the components of bex triad first one hypotension as i told hypotension second one distended neck veins distended neck veins the ne neck veins are distended distended neck veins and third one muffled heart sound when you auscultate with your stethoscope you are not able to hear your heart sound so that is called as muffled heart sounds so this three together we, when you have a patient with suspected pericardial effusion and you are able to see there is a hypotension there is distended neck veins and there is muffled heart sound on auscultation that is called as bex triad and you need to suspect what you need to suspect cardiac tamponade so the treatment for cardiac tamponade is pericardial synthesis if the same patient if you are not identifying the patient will go into cardiac arrest 
So at that time, if you have to do a focus assessment sonography or any time when you have suspect, you have to put an echo probe and see whether there is any pericardial effusion causing a tamponine. You need to aspirate that. So that is the treatment. So that is regarding your cardiac tamponine. <coughs> what is the next D that we need to discuss? That is the tension pneumothorax. So tension pneumothorax. So similarly, similarly in this uh, what we discussed, so this is the lungs, okay, lung parenchyma, this is the heart, this is the normal pleural cavity, okay, so lungs will be situated here, imagine, this is the right lung and this is the, this is the left lung, okay, normally this is the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, Visceral pleura and parietal pleura. This is how the normal thing is happening. What is happening here? There is a sudden, for example, there is a brokage of a rib. So this rib is going and causing a trauma to the lung. And there is an air leak here. Imagine there is an air leak here. So there is an air leak here. And as a result, what will happen? This air will start getting accumulated here. So what will happen to this lung? This lung will get start getting collapsed. So that is a no, pneumothorax. So that is a normal pneumothorax. What will happen after some time? This pneumothorax will start expanding. So this pneumothorax will start expanding and will start compressing the heart. And again, it will start compressing the heart, resulting in decrease in cardiac output and decrease in venous return, resulting in hypotension. So when you will suspect a tension pneumothorax, which all who are more prone to develop a tension pneumothorax following chest trauma, chest trauma. That is the first thing. What is the next group of patient can have tension pneumothorax? Patient known COPD already is having they are having an hyperinflated lung they might be having some emphysematous changes there might be bullets like just like balloons they will have in the lungs so that balloon can explode at any point of time so these group of patients you need to suspect if they have like background history who had a breathlessness and sudden onset of collapse remember that tension pneumothorax can be there so again tension pneumothorax how will you suspect so what are the clinical features that you need to have the tension pneumothorax again just like in cardiac tamponite, they might not be in cardiac arrest always. They can have initially to start with hypoxia and hypotension. And if you are not recognizing that, and they will go into cardiac arrest. So how will you recognize that? Again, it will be hypotension. So that will be the most important thing. Again, the patient will have hypotension. Second thing, what will be the finding? What you can have? What else you can have? The air and re, absent air and re on the affected side. There is no air and re on the affected side. For example, you are suspecting a right side and pneumothorax. You are auscultating the right side. There is no air entry. And what is the third thing? On the affected side, there can be distended neck veins. On the affected side, there can be distended neck veins. If it's a right side, there can be distended neck veins on that side. So that is how you have to differentiate tension pneumothorax. And what is the treatment that you need to do for tension pneumothorax? You have to do what is called as needle decompression, needle decompression, needle decompression. So what is the basically needle decompression? See, as I told, there is a large, this is imagine the lung, there is a large pneumothorax, this is the collapsed lung, imagine. So what we are doing, we are putting a needle in the fifth or fourth in the costal space in the mid axillary line and we are just letting out this air so that the length can expand. That is the initial treatment. And followed by you have to put in something called as intercostal drainage, intercostal tube drainage. So where to put needle decompression, you have to do needle compression in the left, sorry, in the affected side, fourth or fifth intercostal space, anterior to the mid axillary line. That I have already told, mid axillary line. What is mid axillary line and all I have already explained. So mid axillary line is the, if, suppose you have an axilla, there is something called as triangle of safety. So this is your anterior axillary fold. This is the posterior axillary fold. You have the axilla. So this is the anterior axillary fold. This is the posterior axillary fold. And base will be the fifth rib. Okay. And you will have the ribs like this. So this is the fifth rib. So base of the triangle is formed by the fifth rib. And you need to put a needle here or here. And later on with an intercostal tube drainage. So it should be placed. This is the anterior axillary line. This is the mid axillary line. This is the posterior axillary line anterior to the mid axillary line anterior to the mid axillary line is where you need to put the needle 
or the ICD. So that is called as triangle of safety. So what is the last H that what is the last T that we need to discuss? Toxins. So toxins always remember that any toxin the patient had you don't get any clue. So toxins is the next thing that you need to remember. You don't get any clue. You have asked there is nothing but the patient by standing we have seen some empty strips lying down at his home. We are not very sure. He is taking some sleeping pills. We are not sure. He is taking some drugs or the, he has consumed something. All this history that points towards toxins and that toxin, which toxin we will not be able to say immediately. We need to have an toxidromic approach after uh, resuscitation only we will come to know. Suppose you get a glow that okay this patient has taken a tricyclic antidepressant or certain drugs which has got antidote. We can try giving those antidotes. Otherwise it is very difficult during the uh, course of time during a cardiac arrest. So that concludes all our H and T. So this is what in a nutshell that you need to remember regarding the you have to treat the reversible cause of cardiac arrest. That's what you have to do. You have to treat it. So before treating you have to have recognize it. So how will you recognize it? With these clues you should be able to recognize. So each one how to recognize I have told. So we have covered hypovolemia, hypoxia, Hydrogen ions, hypo or hyperkalemia, hypothermia, tension pneumothorax, tamponide, toxins, thrombosis, both pulmonary as well as coronary. So this concludes our complete adult cardiac arrest algorithm because already we have gone through this in the last class. So we have been completed this. So that is the reversible causes of cardiac arrest that you need to remember. Now what we will go do in the next class is the you have to go with the post cardiac arrest care that we will discuss in the next class okay